Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, my name is Ray Gerard. Welcome to another edition of St. Paul's Letters to America. This is the program that imagines what if St. Paul were alive today? What if looking at what is happening in our country today, he could write a letter to America? What would he tell us? Well, here on this program, we give you precisely such a letter. We then utilize that letter for an in-depth discussion of an issue that is current in our lives and our society. Today, we look at it through the lives of St. Paul. And as we do this, we always bear our motto in mind, love and kindness through the light of truth. And um, we're going to probably be challenged a bit uh, with that today, because today what we're going to take up as an issue that uh, is important for everybody here in America, uh, even though it centers around an event that is not taking place in America. It centers around uh, the what is known as, what has been called the Amazon Synod that is taking place in Rome. And uh, if you're not aware of it, uh, or if you're loosely aware of it, uh, we're going to hopefully uh, enlighten you a, a good bit more in today's program. The uh, the Synod has uh, created a lot of controversy. It is a hot issue. And the challenge for us today is uh, to uh, discuss the ideas that are being bandied about at the Synod and bandied about and considered at the Synod while doing so in a way that is respectful. It is um, the... Um, the attitude of both myself and, and Bob Hennigus, and, and Bob is joining me again today. Bob, thank you for being here. Welcome very welcome to the show. Thank you. Good morning. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. And um, so what we're going to be talking about is uh, the Synod, and we both um, believe that the, the people that are participated in the Synod have good intentions. They have the best of intentions. They are trying to do what they think is right. And so it is never uh, our uh, belief that there is a place for denigrating people on any kind of a personal level. That may happen in politics. That's not going to happen here. But what we do believe is that it is important to talk about the ideas that are being uh, considered. If we do not talk about the ideas, if we ignore the ideas, then, in fact, we are are not fulfilling, I think, a duty that we all have as as participants you know, in the church. If, in fact, the church is going astray, we need to talk about that. We need to help that from happening. And if, in fact, the church is on the road to making some changes that are fruitful, then we should you know, talk about that, recognize that, and support that. But it is important always to talk about the ideas. Now, why is the Synod so controversial? Well, there are, are a lot of reasons. Uh, the Synod has come about, by the way, because uh, Pope Francis in October of 2017 um, announced uh, the intention to hold such a conference, and he wanted he appointed some people to uh, come up with some proposals for what could be done to promote uh, the the presence of the church in the Amazon region in, in South America. How could we better evangelize the people in those areas? And so for two years, they've been studying this particular question. And in June of this, well, let me back up. In, in April of this year, uh, there was a meeting of a subgroup in Bogota, Colombia. Um, and, and like I said, that was April of this year. We'll uh, perhaps touch a little bit about uh, uh, on that meeting as well during this discussion. But then in June of this year, they released what was, what was called the Instrumentum Laboris, which is basically a working paper. And what it, the purpose of that working paper was to lay out um, the ideas. It was supposed to be an outline for the discussion of the synod. It laid out the issues and the questions that have been identified by you know over the course of those two years by the people working on this uh, to sort of you know give give an outline for, for the for the work of the synod. 
And so they released this paper, and it created uh, a lot of hot and intense discussion. And why? Well, it's about 100 pages long, and um, within that document, uh, there's an emphasis on nature, the land, the water, the flora, the fauna, and Mother Earth. There is a lot of talk about the indigenous people that live in the Amazon region living in communion with nature. There's talk about their ancestral wisdom that has been passed down for thousands of years. Uh, There's a reference and respect for the ancient healing practices of uh, the indigenous peoples uh, using the local plants that they that they you know find in the jungle and so forth. There's talk about the religious rites, symbols, and customs of the indigenous peoples and the benefits of integrating them into the liturgy and sacraments of the church. There's a respect for the dialogue that the people have, the indigenous people have, with the quote-unquote spirits of nature. Um, There's a reference to the church um, in respecting all these things and at the same time being on a journey in search of its own identity, in search of the identity of the church. There are references to the father-mother creator. Um, there's a, there's a, a great focus on um, uh, the interests, uh, the activities of, of lay people, politics, education, health care, just societal issues, uh, but politics in particular. Uh, and there's a noted scarcity perhaps uh, could be the word uh, that might be appropriate, of references to the Eucharist and to Christ. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, there are the, several issues that have generated a lot of discussion, uh, which are, for example, um, the ordination of uh, married women, uh, ordination of women to probably the diaconate. I mean, that's, um, I think, all that the discussion has taken up at the present, uh, although the fear is that uh, if that is decided uh, in a favorable way and women are allow- allowed to be ordained to the diaconate, that you know maybe it won't be too many years down the road before people propose the ordination of women to the priesthood. And there's also another hot issue of um, the celibacy of, of our priests and, and, and whether or not we should allow married men. Uh, very probati, as the, the term is used in the document. Uh, respected uh, men, uh, married men, to the to the priesthood, but those issues, although they're uh, you know very much you know as I say uh, in you know in vogue, they they you know garner a lot of attention and a lot of people like, like to speak about those. The I think the more fundamental issue is the overall direction of this working document, the overall direction of the synod, the overall direction of um, this emphasis on indigenous peoples and their uh, the faith that they have in communion with nature versus a faith which is Christocentric. That really is the dividing line uh, for our discussion. And um, I should also mention at the outset that um, the voices that have been uh, proclaimed in public about the synod have used some of the most dramatic terms um, for discussing what's happening at the Synod. There have been a lot of cries and accusations of heresy and even apostasy. And we'll get into some of those as well and look at some of those and the reasons you know, for those claims and, perhaps, and, and whether or not there's any merit to those claims. But before doing all of that, before doing all of that, uh, we are going to, as always, refer to a letter from St. Paul. And the letter is this. Although I am free in regard to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so as to win over as many as possible. To those who belong to the Jewish faith, I became like one who belongs to the Jewish faith, though I myself do not belong to it, to win over those who do belong to it. To those who belong to other faiths, I became like one who belongs to those other faiths, though I myself do not belong to them, but to faith in Christ, to win over those who do belong to them. To the weak I became weak, to win over the weak. I have become all things to all, to save at least some. All this I do for the sake of the gospel, the gospel of God, which he promised previously 
through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel about his son, descended from David according to the flesh, but established as son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness through resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now that is a short uh, uh, editing and and, uh, amalgamation of uh, uh, parts of several letters of St. Paul, one being his first letter to the Corinthians. We slightly altered it. The original uh, version, the version written by St. Paul himself, referred to being under the law, not under the law, uh, so just for ease of perhaps uh, understanding what he was talking about, we referred to the Jewish faith. And uh, the amalgamation that we uh, built into the reading today involves the fact that we also pulled a little piece of Paul's letter to the Romans, the very first part of his letter to the Romans uh, from chapter 1 of that letter, actually the first several verses of chapter 1 of that letter. But I think it expresses really what's on the table for us today, which is, yes, um, you know, even Paul uh, decided that he was going to become all things to all, but for what purpose? As he said um, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he's become all things to all for the sake of the gospel. And then we borrowed from his letter to the Romans to explain what gospel it was. He was talking about the gospel, of, co- of course, of, of Jesus Christ. So there's a dividing line. We have to, you know, Paul himself, the great evangelizer, the one who perhaps more as much as anybody else or more than anybody else spread, you know, the gospel of, of Christ around the Mediterranean to the to the Greeks and to the Romans. Uh, more than anybody else responsible, perhaps, for the expansion of the church um, in, the, in the ancient world. St. Paul himself, uh, you know, was not at all bashful of saying that he had become all things to all. So what does he? What did? And as as the living as a living word, what does he still mean by that uh, to us as we read those uh, those writings today? What does it mean to become all things to all for the sake of the gospel? Uh, where do we draw the line? And of course, that is in fact the subject that is. Uh, Really, uh, on the table at the at the synod uh, today. So uh, let's uh, let's in fact talk about the synod, and perhaps um, the best place to start is um, at the source, and the source is uh, Instrumentum Laboris, the working document. This uh, hundred pages of, of material outlining uh, the issues that are being discussed uh, behind the. Uh, presently closed doors of the Synod. And what do we find in that document? I mean, you can often hear a lot of people talk about what's going on at the Synod. And uh, frequently, you know, what what I find is it's, it's nowhere near as good as going directly to the source to find out exactly for yourself what is being talked about instead of getting something secondhand and have somebody tell you, you know, what it's about. Because invariably, you know, opinions and and attitudes creep in. So let's go to the working document itself, the printed document. What's what is in there? Well, there's a lot of talk about oppressors and colonizing. Uh, there's a lot of talk about economic forces still to this day, major corporations and governments in collaboration with major corporations uh, governed by profit and greed, uh, still oppressing, still colonizing the people. And there's a great need to respond to that, and so uh, there's a whole uh, you know area of the um, uh, of the working document that speaks of you know having uh, uh, members of the church training people to become active in politics and fighting for certain uh, political stances and so forth. So there's there's that aspect to the synod, which has its roots in uh, basically liberation theology, which is been prevalent in South America since the 1960s and 70s. And that's a whole uh, another discussion. Um, there's a talk about uh, the fact that the indigenous peoples living in communion with, with nature uh, in South America um, are engaged in good living. Um, there's reference to the fact that there are various, that they're in, they're in contact with various spiritual forces. There's actually language that says 
we are water, air. Um, well, let me I can grab the exact language. Um, to talk to the fact that um, uh, we, the indigenous species, we are part of nature because we are water, air, earth, and life of the environment created by God. Uh, therefore, we ask that the mistreatment and extermination of Mother Earth cease. The Earth has blood and is bleeding. The multinationals have cut the the, the veins of of Mother Earth. Um, so there's, you know, we are water, air, uh, nature. We are part of Mother Earth. There's there's language like that in this in this document. Uh, um, you know, this this talk of the territory, the land. Uh, becoming a, a locus theologicus, a, a theological place where uh, things of a divine nature or divinity is revealed. There's talk of uh, brother tree that we this, there's references to brother tree, sister flower, sister birds, brother fish. Um, there are talks of of rites and, and ceremonies uh, with regard to the actions of the spirit, the many named divinity. There's respect for the ancestral wisdom uh, that has been uh, gleaned by the indigenous peoples over thousands of years, um, and that that, in some respect, should be preserved or at least respected. Uh, that there's, there is, in fact, uh, or that they have, in fact, much to teach us from the seeds of the word over thousands of years. Um, so, you know, right right there you, you get some idea uh and these are these are references to the the language that you will find in this this working document uh you know and they're, they're, and they're, and they go throughout the document the the dialogue with the spirits that they talk about um uh, you know that the uh, indigenous uh, indigenous rituals are essential um you know, and that in some ways these should be incorporated uh, into uh, into the liturgy of the church as it is going to be practiced uh, down in in South America. So there is, and there's references to the like I said, like I think we said in the opening of the program, Father, Mother, Creator. Um, so there's a heavy, heavy emphasis all throughout this working document on nature. Um, the indigenous people uh, living in the jungles down there, being in communion with nature, that they are living, in fact, a, a good life, and that there's much to learn from this close uh, contact uh, with uh, nature. Um, uh, da, 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 let's see. Um, uh, there's, um, there's reference to, in fact, um, their faith, um, the people down there like their faith in in somewhat of a of a favorable way um and um you know and so this like i said there's there is there is this emphasis on um on religion being found in nature that penetrates the document uh, from the uh, you know basically from the beginning to the end of the document and what however is in fact rather lacking uh it's almost um and i want to be i want to be careful about my words and i want to be accurate but it is almost non-existent in this this 100 page document to find uh, references to christ and the eucharist are almost non-existent and so um it um, you know it's, it's it's this aspect i think more than any other that has um, agitated a lot of people. Now, uh, one such person who has spoken out about the Synod is Cardinal Gerhard Mueller. And he gave an interview with uh, an Italian uh, newspaper. And in that interview, you know, they asked him, uh, you know, for his views on the Synod. And one of the things he said about this instrument of laboris was that it has nothing to do directly with the theological approach to the self-revelation of God in Jesus Christ, who is the incarnate word, true God and true God and true man. Um, uh, there is no mention, he says, of the root of human dignity, of the universality of salvation, of the church as the universal sacrament of the salvation of the world. 
There are only profane ideas which can also discuss, but they have nothing to do, which we can also discuss, but they have nothing to do with revelation. Uh, so that's his uh, take on it. He's got a lot, a lot to say about it, but it's this idea that, uh, I, I guess the question that, that is that is brought up, the question that a lot of people have is, do we? How much do we really believe, or do the the people that have been involved in this process? Frankly, how much of a belief in the Eucharist, um, in the pivotal moment of history that came from the incarnation of of Christ? How much do we believe in that? Because I think the the um, the implication is that if you believe in that with your whole heart, there would be some emphasis on bringing the word of that to the indigenous peoples. Um, so I guess that's the first element that we have, um, you know, uh, just this, this question of how much of a belief really is there? I guess, Ray, I'd, I'd just like to mention a couple things. One, we always need to remember that everything is God and everything is, and God is Jesus. And it is through the breaking of the bread and the bringing us to communion with Jesus and with God and then his death, Jesus' death, that allowed us to be in communion with God. And anything else outside of that is part of our life. But it is not our direction. It's not our focus. I guess if I was to put this similarly, if you were to drop somebody who'd never been to New York City and they came up with a whole set of answers, they would say, it's, we've got to believe in God and Wall Street and the making of money and the exchange of money and make all of those kind of comments that that is what we need. But that is not who God is in New York. God is... Jesus Christ, our creator, and it is not money. In fact, Jesus on numerous occasions mentions that money is not something that should become our God. And it is really, really dangerous to start saying that things like Mother Nature and Mother Earth become our God rather than Jesus Christ himself in the Eucharist. That is really dangerous territory to begin to put something else in front of God. And whether it's New York City or whether it's St. Louis or whether it's Toronto, Canada, you can't go in and take the things that are there that are native and say they will be God. They will be they will come from God. All things come from God. But you have to be really careful when you start putting something in God's place and saying we're going to interweave it into the story and leave out the greatest moment in time when Jesus Christ broke bread with his disciples and gave us his body and blood, and then died for our sins. That has to be the focus. And it seems to me that we're missing that wonderful focus that has been in the Catholic Church since those first days when Jesus was here on earth. So, you know, we talked about uh, going right to the source, and going to the uh, working document. Paragraph 87 of the Instrumentum Laboris says... Uh, quoting, indigenous rituals and ceremonies are essential for integral health because they integrate the different cycles of human life and nature. They create harmony and balance between human beings and the cosmos. They protect life from evils that can be caused by both human beings and other human beings. They help to cure diseases that harm the environment, human life, and other human beings. Indigenous rituals and ceremonies, not focused on Christ, re- religious uh, ceremonies, are integral uh, to human health. Um, they create harmony and balance between human beings and the cosmos. Indigenous rituals that create harmony and balance, indigenous rituals that are not centered on Christ, they create harmony and balance with the cosmos. That's the statement. Well, what about achieving harmony with all of existence? by centering your focus on Christ, through whom, I mean, we read, you know, in the Bible, through whom all things are made, who was there at the moment of creation, the person for whom all things were made, and in whom 
all things hold together. You know, we're we like to quote St. Paul on this program. <laughs> yeah, so so we'll do that again. We'll do that again here. You know, that was the perception of St. Paul who had dramatic revelations and, and direct contact, you know, with God on the road to Damascus and and uh perhaps as well at other times. Um you know, how can you get to have better contact with the cosmos than to have contact with the creator? Um, you know, and and we can do that directly in the Eucharist. Um, so, you know, in any event, I mean, you will not find in Instrumentum Laboris anything that says that the Eucharist is not, you know, the real presence of Christ. You won't find anything that says the Mass should not include the Eucharist. But what is being said? I guess that's that's a question people have. When you say these indigenous rituals are important because they create harmony, you know, with the uh, with the cosmos. Um, you know, I you know, I, it just it creates, I think, in the minds of people who read that, the question. Well, but if you believe that Christ is everything, wouldn't you say that? You know. Um, now that we mentioned, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, just to, to work with you, Ray, and toss this in. One of the things that comes to mind as I'm sitting here in is that the first commandment is, "I am the Lord your God. You shall not put false gods before you." Um, I think we we need to understand and make sure that we're not putting a false god, which is the earth, or any other rituals or any other beliefs before God. Right? That is. As Catholics, we have to believe that God our Father, Jesus Christ his Son, who suffered and died for us and gave us the Eucharist, and the Holy Spirit, which is the love between the two, has got to be first. That has to be fundamental. We have to reach to that first, and that has to be the first of all. And if instead we're putting something else in that blurs the picture, that colors the picture differently, we're making a huge mistake. Whether it be money or whether it be friendships, or whether it be anything else, we have got to put Christ first. Because if we miss that, if we miss that, we are going down the wrong path. We are human beings who are drawn to all kind of wonderful and 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 uh, wonderful things. I would show my children when they were young a really shiny penny, and they were just thrilled to death with that. Right? They were enamored. We are drawn away, and we need to remember that the focus is Jesus. It is Jesus who is our example, and Jesus who we have to be like not rituals that any one group of people might come in. And if we put those rituals high enough on the list, if we give them enough priority, they take the place of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, and we have to be really careful there, really careful. So uh, speaking about being careful, let, let, let us be careful. So I want to read again directly from uh, the instrument in Laboris. And it says... Um, A process of discernment, this is paragraph 126a, a process of discernment is needed regarding the rites, symbols, and styles of celebration of indigenous cultures in contact with nature, which need to be integrated into liturgical and sacramental rituals. Let me repeat that. A process of discernment is needed regarding the rites, symbols, and styles of celebration of indigenous cultures in contact with nature, which need to be integrated into liturgical and sacramental which rituals. It seems like this is a... Um, uh, I mean, it talks about a process of discernment, but it seems to be suggesting that these uh, rituals of the indigenous peoples, uh, which are based on um, their perception of religion, their, their, uh, you know, their experience with, with religion and spiritual forces in nature need to be incorporated into the sacraments and the rituals of the church. Again, it's this is why people talk about um, you know, Christ and a Christocentric approach uh, not being apparent from the document. So um, you know, and I'll, I'll draw just one more um, connection on the same theme. We mentioned the fact that in April of this year, the, the working paper was released, the Instrumentum Laboris was released in June of this year. Uh, there was a meeting in Bogota, Colombia earlier this year in April, 
And uh, there was a paper released from that. And uh, there were two people who wrote that paper that were also key authors of the Instrumentum Laboris. And one of the things that it says in that document, I'm going to quote directly, because I just, you know, as we've said before, you do want to be careful. It says, um, uh, da, 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 the liturgy, they're talking about the liturgy of uh, the church, the liturgy is the summit. Oh, excuse me, let me back up. Uh, in the liturgy, uh, the church expresses her faith in a symbolic and communal way. Well, that in and of itself calls into mind a question. The liturgy, of course, has two main features, the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. So if this applies to both facets of the Mass, are they saying that the liturgy of the Eucharist is symbolic? Are these authors of this document, the, the bishops, who, the South American bishops who participated in this, is that, in fact, what they're saying? Um, it's at least a very legitimate question. In the liturgy, the Church expresses her faith in a symbolic and communal, communal way. The Constitution Sacrosanctum Concilium explains that the liturgy is the summit and source of Christian life. Now, we're going to just interject again. Uh, source and summit of, Christ, Christian, of, of Catholic faith, of Christian life, um, that is not a new phrase. That is a phrase uh, that exists in uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church explains um, very directly and explicitly that the source and summit of Christian life is the Eucharist. The source, the very source of Christian life, the beginning, is the Eucharist. The summit, the highest peak you can reach, is the Eucharist. It's the Alpha and the Omega. It is Christ himself. That is our catechism. This then refers to the fact that the liturgy is the summit and source of Christian life. I mean, in, 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 in direct, you know, consistent fashion with the catechism. But then it continues. The liturgy is the summit because at the foot of the table is presented the experience of people, the path of the community, and the social, socio-cultural context in which it operates. Source because from the living memory of the love of Christ and from the encounter with the sisters and brothers, the desire and capacity for more coherent discipleship uh, and more effective witness are born. So it's the summit because uh, at the table uh, for the sacrifice during the Mass is presented the experience of the people, the socio-cultural context uh, in which they operate. Um, so it refers to society, culture, the daily experiences of people. Um, that's the, the summit in the view of these authors. It's the source, the liturgy is the source of the Christian faith because from the living memory of Christ. And again, if in fact Christ is present in a real way in the Mass, if it is a representation of um, you know his sacrifice for us, uh, oh, I forget the the term. I used to on the tip of my tongue. I used to know it, but when um, the mass, when the priest repeats during the mass, the words "Do this in memory of me," the very words of Christ at the, from the Last Supper. When he repeats those words, he is in fact establishing a link that operates outside the bounds of time that take us back to the Last Supper. And this has roots in the Jewish celebration of the Passover because their belief was that um, the grace that um, the people um, that were in Egypt at the time of the Passover, the grace that they received directly from the hand of God could be shared by their, uh, you know, by by their descendants, even centuries later, if you remembered the Passover, memory and remembering was much more than just sort of uh, this this mental, you know, operation where you had thoughts in your head and you simply, you know, remembered them like like we think of rem no remembering was jo was a way of joining. It was very spiritual. 
All you have to do is, 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 is conjure this up in your mind, and you are spiritually transported it back to those people in that time. It is very spiritual. It, it doesn't... It doesn't believe it's not physical. It's it's outside of uh, of of our human bodily experiences. That was the Jewish tradition that was well understood by Christ and the people at the Last Supper, the Jews at the Last Supper, when he used those same words. He was calling forth that a practice of of the Jewish faith and said that when they celebrated the Eucharist after this, in memory of him, that they would be. And people understood that what he meant by that was that they would be doing the same thing, that they would be transported back mystically outside space and time in a spiritual fashion to that very last supper, and that we could then share in the same grace of the that was given to the apostles at the last supper when he shared with them his body and blood um, that, in fact, if we celebrated the Eucharist in memory of him, we would do the same. We would share in the body of blood as if the very hand of Christ that was there at the Last Supper handing out the bread and the, and the wine was there doing it for us. And, of course, that's what the priest does. He operates, you know, in, um, is it, was it Loco Christi? Or, or in, I, I forget the, the term, the exact term. I, again, I'm, and there are these terms that are on the tip of my tongue, and I'm uh, for some reason not being able to recall them right now. And Persona Christi, I'm sorry. Uh, anyways... Um, you know, so this is uh, this is all very real. This is not, uh, you know, excuse uh, excuse the phrase symbolic. This is all uh, very real. So to go back to this again, it's the source because from the living memory, living memory of the love of Christ. Um, does living memory refer to what we're talking about, or does it talk about Christ? You know, that we just simply remember him more in the sense that we use the term normally uh, remembering. Uh, again, at least it calls into a, a question. This, so this Bogota document talks about the fact that it's the source, the liturgy is the source of Christian life because from the living memory of the love of Christ and from the encounter with sisters and brothers, uh, the desire and So from our encounter with other people, the desire for love and so forth, from our encounters with other people, uh, that's why, you know, it's the... Uh, it's it's the source of our Christian faith. So there's a focus on the experiences of people, the memory of Christ, uh, again, with the caveat as to what exactly they mean by that. Um, you know, but all of this discussion that we have, um, you know, social, political, social, cultural experience of the people, you know, these, uh, all of this, you know, the, perhaps we don't even need to bandy about the words or try to dissect the words of exactly what they mean by this language. The fact is, that what they are not saying is that the source and summit of Christian life is exactly what the Catechism says is the source and summit of, of Christian life, which is the Eucharist. Yeah, Ray, I I think that as time goes on, when Vatican II occurred, we wanted to allow people to become closer to God and in communion with God, and we changed the way we celebrated in order to allow that to happen. And I think that's a good thing. We want to continue to bring people to Jesus Christ and allow them to take part in the Mass and to participate and to be with him. The danger that you're speaking of is that if we take away the focus on Jesus, if we allow other things to creep in and not only not become more important, not even become as important, but almost as important as the Eucharist and as Jesus Christ, Mother Earth, or anything else, we are making a huge mistake. Because we as humans can flitter off in a thousand directions. That's what we do. We grab things, we grab things that are familiar, and we all of a sudden think those are good because they're familiar. And that's not the case. The truth of God is what we want to chase. And that's not easy. That's not easy to do. We tend to run to many other things, and we cannot lose focus that it is God that we wish to follow. It is the Eucharist that we want to be involved in, and we can move around how we celebrate, but we can't put anything else in front of that because we will run to that. We will run to those other things rather than running to God himself because we're human beings. We make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time, and we have to be really careful. And it's it's a bit scary to me as we talk that we would lose what for so long has been our focus. We, we're, we're making a dangerous and grave mistake to allow ourselves to drift away 
from who Jesus Christ is. And a wonderful and beautiful celebration. I wish so many times I have never had the chance to be to the Holy Land. I hope to do that. And had a trip that I thought I might take, and then I ended up getting transferred and wasn't able to do it. But I myself went to be there in the room where Jesus Christ shared the bread and shared the wine that became his body and blood, because that is our focus. And I certainly have experienced it in Mass every week since I was, you know, a couple days old, and really want to get there and do that. But I believe with all my heart that is where I should be, right? We do things like adoration. I love to go to adoration because I am there sharing the body of Christ. It is right there on the altar in front of me, and I get to adore that and worship that and focus that and know that Jesus Christ is there with me. We can't let ourselves dash off and be worried about Mother Earth or other fads or other ways of of doing things. We have to keep that as our focus. We do have to update and bring people along so that they are there and can really receive Jesus, but we got to be careful about not going off off sideways. Now just uh just a word in in the line of a reality check. Uh I want to be clear that this is only a working document. Uh, we do not know uh, what the, the votes and the results of the Synod will be. And even if uh, there are votes uh, that come out of the Synod to approve uh, some things along these uh, along, along the lines of what's being discussed uh, on this program, um, that's not necessarily uh, going to be the, you know, the practices. Uh, I mean, they're not going to be automatically and instantly, they're not going to automatically and instantly become the practices of the church. Uh, they will then have to be, you know, approved by the Pope and I'm not uh, Pope and I'm not, Sure, perhaps, you know, there's some other process that they'll have to go through. You know, a synod is to come up with recommendations. So uh, let's, let's you know, be clear. We don't want to over-dramatize, over-dramatize things and, and uh, make people overly fearful of what's happening. But at the same time, the fact that these things are even being discussed is dramatic enough. So uh, to go back, um, I want to, uh, again, go back to... Um, this interview given by uh, uh, Cardinal Mueller. And he talked specifically about uh, the role of nature. And he said something perhaps um, a little surprising or perhaps a, a, little, a little harsh, but nevertheless, uh, it seems you know, quite accurate. He says that um, you know, there is not, uh, we shouldn't confuse, God is not nature. We should not confuse God with nature. He says, the essence of biblical monotheism is the ontological difference between creator and creation. God is not part of his work. He is sovereign above all created things. So while God is present in nature, and while, you know, we can have you know some feeling of, or we can somehow detect, you know, God's presence in nature. I mean, I, uh, was it, is it the first chapter of Romans where St. Paul talks about, you know, people who are pagan, uh, all they have to do is, is look at the world around them. All they have to do is, is look at nature to see the presence of God. And because they don't do that and choose to, you know, worship pagan idols instead, that they are, in fact, committing a grave offense against God. So it is possible um, to detect the presence of God in nature. But God cannot be confused with nature because he is above nature. He's not part of it. He is above it. And that perhaps is a, uh, you know, an important uh, distinction. Um, so there's that. Um, and, uh, you know, he even says that it is one thing to have respect for the elements of this world. It is another to idolize or divinize them. The identification of God with nature is a form of atheism because God is independent of nature. It's interesting to me that he would use the word. It's a form of atheism, a uh, very strong language, but um, a form of atheism. So that if, um, if you equate, if you divinize nature, you know, if you, um, Perhaps adopt some of these these indigenous uh, people's rituals in, a, in an attempt to maybe reach out to them and speak to them on uh, in terms that they uh, are comfortable with. Um, if it's just simply an analog an evangelical uh, tool, an evangelizing tool, um, you may run the risk of either 
uh, you know, uh, getting to the point where you divinize nature yourself, or at least lead people to think that you're divinizing nature. And so if you do that, now you've got uh, basically an earthly God. And I think that's what, what Cardinal Mueller was talking about when he says, well, that's a form of atheism, because you're not believing in God. Um, you know, people who don't believe in God, they certainly believe in nature. You know, there are plenty of, you know, atheists uh, walking around right now who, you know, extol the, the, the virtues of, of science. And certainly, you know, science explores, you know, all the, the different facets and the minutiae that can be found in, in nature. And so, yeah, it is a form of, of atheism if you confuse the two. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's to me significant that a cardinal in the Catholic Church can talk about this synod in such terms. What is he saying? He's saying that the things that are being discussed go to the very heart and the very foundation of our faith. They go to the difference between belief in God and atheism. They, they go to the difference between uh, you know, the, a Christian faith and paganism. Uh, this is, I think what they're worried about is the fact that there is a danger there's a very, there's an extreme danger here, um, but we don't have to you know just rely on just simply you know one cardinal. Uh, there's others. Cardinal Brandon Mueller is another. Cardinal Burke is another. Now these are uh, conservative cardinals. These are uh, cardinals that people would suggest are conservative. They put that label on them. Um, but if we're first you know following the a path of truthfulness, if we're on a path that leads to the truth, if we're following the truth. Um, wouldn't we have all cardinals in the church, whether you're a so-called liberal Catholic or a so-called conservative Catholic? Aren't there certain basic things we can all agree on? Um, and if not, then really, who are we? I mentioned before that the uh, Instrumentum Laboris talks about, was it, the, was it that document or perhaps it was the Bogota document? I think it is, in fact... Um, I think it is, in fact, the Instrumentum Laboris, but um, I'd, have to, I'd have to check that. But um, in any event, there was a reference uh, by some of the people participating in the Amazon Senate, at least some, to the fact that the church is in search of its identity, that it's on a journey, uh, and it's in search of its identity. Now, this goes back to, the, to a, 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 it goes back to some of the underpinnings of liberation theology, uh, which has a lot of uh, basis in socialism and the philosophical uh, roots to, of Hegel and uh, that, that stretch back to Hegel and Marx, which that is that history is just this continual path uh, charting the progress of man and that it marches on and on and that each moment of history is is a is a point along along that path and um, you know so in that sense when you when you look at the history of of man in that context. We're going from point A to point B, and and so on and so forth. Um, then yeah, you're on a journey. But there is a point to be raised, an important point to be raised, which is: Is Christ the pivotal moment in history? Does not the incarnation of Christ change all history, and that all history of man that proceeds? Uh, after the incarnation of Christ, does it not necessarily have to point back, not forward, but back to Christ? Is he not the one event in all of history that changes history? And if, in fact, he is, then we don't have to search for an identity. We have an identity, and the identity is in Christ. And I'm, you know, I mean... Uh, give me a few minutes and I can find, I don't know how many references, you know, in the writings of St. Paul to that, you know, that, that our lives are to be found in Christ, that we have to put off our old selves and put on Christ. That's where, you know, where we were chosen before the foundation of the world. Again, just referring back to other writings of Paul, you know, we were, we were chosen for adoption by the father and that adoption happens through Christ, I, you know, so 
this is just some of the reasons why the thoughts behind and, and the writings that make up these preparatory documents for the Amazon Synod are just, you know, are, are just calling people to question what, in fact, are we talking about? Um, so it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's dramatic, to say the least. Well, I, I'd like to toss in, Ray, that um, before Jesus came to earth, all the writings of the Old Testament point to Jesus. If you read Luke and you read when Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus and his disciples are confused, he brings back and points out to them everything in the scriptures that pointed to him in his life and he would fulfill. Right. Right. So from the beginning of time, when God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit created the earth, it was to point towards the moment when Jesus Christ arrived and died for our sins and celebrated the Eucharist. And then after that, we follow that point. So that is the pinnacle. That's the, the pivotal moment. And the Old Testament was leading to it, and now we follow Jesus' role. And missing that point is against everything that we know and understand. I, that is the point in time that is the one that we should constantly look back to, not with fear, not with concern, but with wonder that he would come and die for our sins and we get to be a part of that and share what he did for us. What a wonderful thing. And to forget that would be crazy. To take something, anything else, and make it more important would be crazy, right? Whether it's the fish or the trees or diamonds or money or another person, none of that can be primary. Jesus Christ has to be primary. Everything else is secondary. Um, so, um, but like I said, you know, it's, it's not like we have to just uh, rely on one cardinal. There are several. And to turn to one of these other uh, so-called conservative cardinals, uh, Cardinal Raymond Burke, the former uh, archbishop here in St. Louis. Right. Uh, he said that the working document, this instrumentum laboris of the Pan-Amazonian Synod, is, these are his words, is a direct attack on the lordship of Christ. Still quoting him, he says, it says to people, um, you already have the answers, and Christ is just wrong among many sources of answers. This is apostasy. Um, and in uh, our quote from uh, Cardinal Burke, and what he's talking about is the fact that when you recognize um, spirits in nature as many named divinity um, as, as can be found in nature, and you respect that and you somehow suggest that maybe uh, rites and ceremonies that respect that should be incorporated into the sacraments and liturgy of the church, um, you are in fact putting those those realizations of the presence of, of God that can be found in nature on a par with, um, you know, the, the revelation that we've received of God through Christ. And when you sort of, you know, equate the two, um, you it, it seems inescapable that you are not um, elevating Christ to the place um, with, to which he, the, you know, the place which he's, you know, the respect to which he is due. I mean, he uses the word apostasy. And I actually had to check my catechism to find what is the definition of heresy and what is the definition of apostasy. And I could, uh, I could pull it out and quote it in the exact language. But basically what it says is that heresy involves the deviation from a particular doctrine of the of the Catholic faith, whereas apostasy is worse because it involves uh, the denial or at least the deviation from, uh, and it may be the actual definition may be in fact the denial. So it's a strong. It may be you know uh, it may be only in the most apostasy may be appropriate only in the most egregious cases, but nevertheless it involves some type of a deviation, if not outright denial, from our entire faith, the faith in Christ himself. So not just the doctrine, but the faith in Christ. When you, de when you, when you depart from that, then you are in the realm of apostasy. 
And he's not the only one who uses that term. There are people that are speaking out very strongly about all of this. And um, so are they right? Are they wrong? Uh, It's obviously for you to judge. We've only been able in the time that we've been allotted so far to uh, quote several, you know, paragraphs directly from the Instrumentum Laboris, um, but they're significant uh, paragraphs, I believe. Um, and uh, there's, there's so much more to talk about with regard to this whole subject matter that actually I think, Bob, uh, if you agree, I think we should continue this in the next program. It sounds wonderful to me. I I think it's something that helps us and really all that's good and all that's bad has been put there by God. And it's for us to choose which is which. And this is one that allows us to begin to learn what it is that God really wants. It is these challenges that we look at these things and understand where God wants us to be. And I think the idea is to love and to pray and to understand what it is that God wants. And so a subject like this, uh, such a big deal, I think is well worth that time. I think it's it's well worth the interest. And I I think, if I'm correct, Ray, I know for myself and I think for you, we're not telling anybody anything. What we're doing is asking people to pray, to think, to love, and to ask God what is correct here. I, I think that's what we should do as Catholics. We should understand what the Catechism says. We should know what the Gospel says. It's read in front of us every week at church. We should know what that says, but then we should pray about it. And is this really pulling away from Jesus Christ in the Eucharist? Or is it really bringing us to that? Is that what the folks are trying to do in this in this forum, is go that direction? For me, I think it's tearing us apart. It's putting another false god in front of us. Uh, it's going against the first commandment, and I think that's what we ought to do. So I look forward to uh, challenging this even further. So we'll continue this uh, and, tr- and, and try to examine this uh, further in the, in the next program. We hope We're glad you joined us for this one. Uh, we hope we've pointed some things out to you that maybe you uh, may not have been aware of, that uh, you find interesting. We hope you join us again next time. But before we close, uh, Bob, I would like to in- invite you to perhaps say a prayer for us, because I think you're absolutely right. We need we need to pray about this, and we need to pray for the people who are participating in the Synod, uh, that the Holy Spirit may guide them. So, Bob, okay. if, you, if you could, could please do that. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thanks for the opportunity to try to follow you, to listen to you, to listen to your words, to read information, and to continue to try to follow you in whatever way you want. Allow us, those listening, ourselves, anyone who might come in touch with this, and allow them to come to you with an open heart and with love to find out what it is that you truly want. That's what we need to do. We need to follow you. We thank you for sending your son to save us from sin itself. And we ask you to continue to lead us, to guide us, and to allow us to follow you with every breath, every beat of our heart, every moment of every day. Follow you with all that we have. And surely we will come to know you and we will come to know your son and the love that you share, which is the Holy Spirit. We pray all this in the wonderful and glorious name of your son, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Son, Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Again, thank you for listening. Uh, Until next time, blessings, may God's choices, blessings be with all of you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.